Good afternoon, everyone. This is David Cerns with Haley Marketing, and welcome to today's Lunch with Haley webinar. All right. I'm really happy to be presenting this webinar, or should I say to have a great team of people joining us today to present this webinar on our lessons from the 2021 Staffing Industry Executive Forum. So this year, uh, sadly, but not unexpectedly, it was a virtual event. And this year, Haley Marketing was a platinum sponsor of the Executive Forum. Um, we wanted to uh, do everything we could to have a big presence, even though we couldn't be face to face with everybody we wanted to see at the conference. Well, there was a ton of information. One of the nice things about having that level of sponsorship is we were allowed to bring eight team members to the executive forum. So we did our best to divide and conquer and attend as many sessions as we could. And during the next uh, 59 minutes or so, our team is going to do our best to try to summarize some of the highlights from what we learned. I will say the executive forum is definitely one of the best uh, educational conferences in the industry. If you've never been, I strongly look, encourage you to look at attending next year's event. I'm not sure where they're holding it, but it's always a lot of fun, fantastic education, and it's going to be so great to get back together face to face in 2022. All right, but for today, what are we going to do? So we're going to be talking about a review of the keynotes. So there were several really outstanding presentations, um, starting with Barry Ason's review of everything that's going on in the industry. We're going to run through very quickly highlights of a large number of the breakouts that we attended. And then we'll recap and wrap up with some of the lessons that our team took home from this year's exec forum. And finally, if time permits, and usually in this webinar, it doesn't permit a lot of time, but we'll try to squeeze in Q&A. So please use the question box as we're going along. If there are things you'd like us to address, we'll do our best to fill in the blank. So ask questions as we go. All right, that stated, it's time to jump into the sessions and we're gonna start off with the keynotes. And I believe, uh, Mandy, you're gonna get us kicked off. Thanks, David. Barry's optimistic that 2021 will look and feel different from last year and thank goodness, right? In his presentation, he explored the key trends and disruptive changes we need to harness to grow in 2021 and beyond. Here are a few of the highlights and top line thinking from his presentation. It was so jam packed with information. I really had to kind of distill it down and focus on some of the top line thinking. First, let's talk a little bit about staffing in the near term. And right now there are two big drivers of uncertainty, the virus and the vaccine. And the big question is, can we get to herd immunity before mutations cause another big spike in infection rates? And right now the news is looking pretty good. We're down from peak levels, but infection rates are leveling off. Um, at the current pace, we should reach herd immunity sometime in September, possibly sooner. The fact that we're turning the corner is reflected in the GDP projection of 4.4% growth in 2021. Uh, we still have a big hole to dig out of. Our nation lost more than 20 million jobs because of COVID, and we've regained about 60% of those. At least that was the statistic at the time of the presentation. Um, not surprisingly, temp jobs are recovering faster. We've regained about 76% of temp jobs, which is typical for what the industry does. And staffing is showing signs of a V-shaped recovery. And as you can see in that little blue chart there, SI analysts is forecasting 12% total growth for the staff industry. And then Barry addressed some long-term themes and trends that have emerged as a result of the pandemic. The first one is that remote work has been a big success. 83% of the employers they surveyed and 71% of employees agree that the shift to remote work has been successful. The second is that the pandemic proved that temporary work can be done remotely. Just 2% of temp jobs were remote in 2019, but 50% were working remotely as of February 2021. And SIA projects that 20% of temp jobs will stay remote after the pandemic ends. These implications of remote work will impact recruiting. 
on the one hand, you're going to have more reach, but you're going to have more competition for talent too. And remote work will also impact the tools you need for IT. It's going to impact your infrastructure and training, your branch structure, your physical space requirements. And we're seeing a sea change in the way employers think about remote work. They're likely to be more open to it in the future, even for temporary assignments, which creates great opportunities for staffing firms who are able to fill those needs. For example, we're um, he also moved on to a third key trend, uh, which was very closely related, and that was digital transformation. And this is playing out in specific ways in the staffing ecosystem. Uh, we're seeing a rapid change in the adoption of online platforms. He spoke at length about that, which enable more direct and self-service connections between enterprises and talent. Barry gave one example of a healthcare travel nurse staffing firm that implemented a self-serve platform in Q2 of 2020, so right in the thick of the pandemic, and they saw explosive growth with headcount up 338%. Let that sink in for a minute. Um, you can compare that to an 85% median industry growth. Um, staffing plat platforms will likely take hold quickly in industries where skills are standard and identifiable and that have a fast time to fill. And he gave a few examples of that, like healthcare crisis staffing, hospitality staffing, industrial and day labor. But he predicts that adoption will be much slower in organizations that specialize in executive recruiting as well as professional level consulting. And then the fourth trend he presented was that diversity and inclusion will become a higher priority for clients. In fact, 63% of the contingent workforce buyers think DNI will become a higher priority moving forward. And then for employers, it's no longer just about diversity in staffing ownership. More and more, they're seeking candidate diversity too. And staffing firms can move the needle and improve DNI by filling what he called the last mile gap in education with reskilling apprenticeships and upskilling offerings. And then Barry concluded his presentation with tips for successful leadership in a VUCA world. If you're unfamiliar with the acronym, VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity in our operating environment. And it's driven by politics, technology, and even the coronavirus. In this new world, leadership is going to be the antidote. And Barry gave four recommendations for leading successfully in a VUCA world. The first one is countering the volatility with vision by clearly communicating your company's directions and goals. Number two, by meeting uncertainty with understanding. And that means being both empathetic and compassionate. Number three, reacting to complexity with clarity, and that involves being transparent. And finally, fighting ambiguity with agility, and that means being prepared to change strategies or tactics to adjust as our economy and the virus evolve. And uh, that's about it for that first keynote presentation. Like I said, there was a ton of great information, but now I'm gonna turn it over to Mackenzie, who's gonna tell us about the second keynote, which was leadership in a new world. Thanks so much, Mandy. Um, this was a great panel discussion. There were four great uh, CEOs and presidents discussing what they'd done in their companies that they felt really worked um, to kind of take on leadership in the new world that we faced in 2020. So one of the first things that they discussed was how, like many businesses, um, it was key to adjust quickly, whether they were working from home, um, fully remote, all the changes that everyone faced last year, adjusting quickly really helped them stay on top of them. Um, they also did things like revise productivity metrics, change uh, business to virtual interaction, and they really felt like those changes that they made in 2020 uh, were going to last long past the pandemic. Um, another thing that they discussed were uh, being where they need to be when candidates and clients need you. So not just being in the office, um, not just being at home, but being exactly where you need to be at the right time um, and how uh, changing how they interact with businesses. So that was really the second big point. Um, using technology to leverage the best place to meet client and candidate needs. Uh, and the third point that they made was uh, the same technology tools uh, that they're using today and in 2020 are changing, but they're incredible and they are very productive. So using those technology tools that you have access to or maybe ones that you've thought about but haven't really taken the dive into using yet, um, those can really help clients with collaboration and automation. 
Um, and that also uh, cited a recent study that said candidates are looking for radical flexibility. So if your business isn't meeting people where they are, if they're not using the technology candidates are using, you're going to miss out um, and you're going to wish that you had been doing these things a lot sooner. So those are the three big points that I took away from this. And now I'm going to pass it over to Mandy again. All right, back over to me. Thank you. All right, this was the disruption mindset, why some organizations transform while others fail. And it was presented by Charlene Lee. Throughout our lives, most of us have been taught to avoid disruption, but Charlene said to embrace it. And her presentation was all about how to not merely survive disruption, but to thrive in it. Over the past year, innovation has been driven by necessity, and this is when disruption creates positive change and opportunity. Right now, the staffing industry is being disrupted because multiple factors are converging. For example, the rate of new business formation spiked 43% after the pandemic hit. Entrepreneurs are opening businesses, they're working for themselves, they're starting new businesses, and all of them need talent. This is going to create a huge wave of staffing and recruiting opportunities in the near future. But the question is, are you going to be the bug or the windshield? That is, will you be the disrupted or the disruptive? And if you want to be the disruptive, she recommends that you lean into the opportunity and that you just embrace the chaos. Right now, your firm has an unprecedented opportunity to define how you want to function in our new reality. Charlene said that disruption demands bold leadership and often massive cultural transformation. And regardless of where your business sits in the spectrum right now, to be on the right side of disruptive change is going to require having a growth strategy that aligns the entire organization around the future customer experience, as well as the leadership and culture to execute that strategy. It's no small task, in other words. Here are a few of her tips for doing this. Number one, chase after your fastest moving customers. She called these the energizer bunnies who are at the leading edge of their industry. The second one is to look to the future and anticipate trends and then make the choice to take the hard road to meet customers where they will be. She used the hockey analogy, and I know that David will appreciate this one, of skating to the, where the puck will be, not where it is. And then third, to be clear about who your future customer is, what their needs and wants will be. She re recommended creating something called an empathy map, and this is more than just a demographic profile. It also includes future customers' pain points, as well as what they'd say, think, and feel, and do differently. Then she said to go ahead and fall in love with that future customer and make it your entire company's mission to serve them well. And then finally, number five, uh, or fifth point was to create a disruptive culture. Uh, you need to have three essential beliefs. The first of those beliefs is openness, and that involves removing obstacles that conflict with openness by creating transparency in decisions to build trust and accountability. The second belief is creating agency. And this is the belief that you already have the ability to take action and drive change. It requires creating a mind shift from I'd like to thinking to I can thinking. And to achieve this change in thinking, you can establish clear disruption practices and processes and actually create a model for creating change. And then define the edges to enable action. And this involves making sure employees understand the rules and what their field of play looks like. And then over time, you can make employees feel bigger as they become more confident with disruptive change. And then her third belief is to accelerate for action. And to speed things up in your staffing firm, you can eliminate processes that don't improve the customer experience and focus on creating better processes for improving customer experience. And then the other one, and this is a hard one, to get comfortable with making good decisions with imperfect data. If you think about defining a minimally viable data that you would need to take action versus traditional decision making in which you'd wait until you know everything possible. It's a very different but important mind shift change. And all of these actions will help you move out of your comfort zone and help everyone in your organization move out of their comfort zone. And that's where disruption happens. Uh, Charlene advises leaders to figure out where the edge of that comfort zone is and then don't retreat from the edge once you find it, but just work one step back from that edge because it's at that edge 
edge where your company can be the most disruptive and thrive in today's in environment. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Susan. She is going to tell us about the first of our breakout sessions and her session was upskilling your talent pipeline for the future. So take it away, Susan. Thanks, Mandy. The, I found the concept of upskilling intriguing because of the challenge that it presents of getting buy-in from hiring managers on the concept that they're hiring on potential and initiative, not hiring candidates who check all the boxes today. COVID kind of accelerated the need for and the buy-in for upskilling programs. So some of my key takeaways were that more and more jobs are requiring digital skills that are hard to find. Um, one of the panelists made the statement that we prepare our graduates for their fifth job, not for their first. And staffing companies need to think of themselves as developers of talent, um, kind of a higher train deploy mentality. A uh, benefit of upskilling programs is it takes away the hiring friction between the staffing company and the client. And the third point, and one I hadn't thought of before, is that upskilling programs allow for targeted hiring and diversity hiring. Um, the panelists had proven success targeting diverse communities and rural communities, or and rural universities, which gives opportunities to people who aren't normally afforded these opportunities, which I thought was a great point. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Mackenzie. Thanks, Susan. Um, this discussion, five benefit realities guaranteed to improve your bottom line in 2021, was essentially about what it sounds like. It was about benefits that actually matter to candidates and employees um, and which ones are important to offer. So the first benefit that they discussed were um, yeah, really having usable, viable benefits um, and mostly monetary benefits. Um, they said fewer than four in 10 US workers can afford a four figure emergency room or car repair by tapping into savings. So providing those sort of benefits really is helpful to them. Um, the second one that they talked about was telemedicine um, and voluntary benefits. Um, telemedicine was up 30% um, last year from the previous year, obviously, which makes sense because people didn't want to go into a doctor's office. 83% um, of patients expect to use telemedicine after the pandemic. So um, using those virtual forward benefits and thinking one step ahead um, can help you provide the sort of things that candidates are looking for. And the last one um, that I added here were uh, adopting digital transformation strategies. 35% um, uh, of companies have ramped up their digital transformation efforts. And of those 33% said, remote recruiting will be more common. Um, so looking ahead, uh, thinking about the future, thinking about digital and virtual forward, and then also making sure that you're really providing the things that your candidates are looking for uh, in terms of benefits is really gonna uh, make a difference uh, to your bottom line in 2021. Um, and now I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan. Ryan, we're not hearing you. Great, it looks like I just had to unmute. Sorry for that, David. Uh, so uh, this was uh, Chris Kennedy driving ROI through conversational bots, new technology for a new world. Uh, Chris Kennedy is the VP of sales from Work Llama. And um, you know, likely this one's on everyone's radar. He mentioned the adoption of chatbots has grown 92% since 2019. Uh, so that makes it the fastest growing brand communication channel and it's highly relevant in staffing. Uh, so you know, for obvious reasons, Winning the talent war requires investment in the candidate experience. Uh, your candidates want a straightforward and streamlined journey and a hiring experience that includes a blended mix of technology and human interaction. So enter the chatbot. In a recent study, 92% of job seekers noted that the most significant advantage to chatbots was the speed of their responses. Couple that with the fact that most candidates perform their job search after working hours. And it begs the question of how can you provide a great experience to them without an automated tool? So that's what we're talking about here with that always on candidate experience. Um, 
you know, your, your candidates, they, they want that straightforward and streamlined journey. And oftentimes they're, they're spending countless hours applying for a single position. To make matters worse, not getting a prompt response shows a lack of respect for all that time. So they get frustrated. Let's talk about increasing recruiter productivity. Uh, your recruiters don't work 24-7, and even if they did, they'd never be able to provide the level of service on their own that your candidates are expecting. Chris shared the stat that, on average, a recruiter interviews six to ten candidates for a job. Then they go through two to three rounds of interviews. So we're talking about an average of 21 interviews per opening. Imagine if you could reduce the number of interviews by 25% by streamlining the process. Chris posits that you can do that with a conversational chatbot, which upfront can better pre-qualify applicants at the front door. Uh, from there, many bots can seamlessly integrate with a recruiting team's work calendar uh, that reduces the, the phone tag drag, and that's a win-win. Recruiters don't have to sift through as many resumes or answer as many basic repeated questions, and the candidates aren't stuck filling out as many lengthy, repetitive forms. And that kind of goes into the creating the time to, to build and, and nurture human connections. So these efficiencies are all meant to free up the recruiter to engage in more high value, personal ways. Remember, the goal of automation is not the absence of human interaction. It's the mechanism that fosters those interactions. Um, there's advanced bots like Work Llamas that can even integrate with assessment technology. Uh, they partner with a company, Glider.ai, um, and they can also generate referrals that can help you tap into 70% of the working folks out there who are passive candidates. He told a story about, uh, you know, someone in the, in the continental U.S. knowing someone in Alaska, and they because they were exposed to an opportunity through the chatbot and the technology, uh, they were able to make a great referral to uh, that Alaskan candidate that would have been really hard to find. Um, all in all, there's a tremendous amount of ROI to be realized from improving both the level of service that your staffing firm affords the talent and the efficiencies that free up your recruiters and your staff to do what they do best. And uh, passing it back to you, Mackenzie. Thanks, Brian. Um, so the next discussion that I was in was the Staffing Exec's Guide to Direct Sourcing and Talent Pools. Um, and the first thing we really covered in there is what is the definition of direct sourcing? So um, their discussion sort of stated that it is using the employer's brand in job advertising to build talent pools ahead of the job requisition. So already having a great pipeline of candidates even before you get a job offer or a, a job opening. Um, the second point was that you really need to educate yourself on what's happening in the space. Um, knowing who the players are and what the solutions are, um, you need to have a strategy to really do a really strong job with direct sourcing. So not just thinking that you want to do it, but knowing how you'll do it, who you'll do it with, and where you're going to get those candidates from. Um, and the third point that they made uh, that I thought really struck home was uh, less than 5 to 10 percent of large clients are doing direct sourcing. Um, so the opportunities are really big if you're tight with the customer. Um, there's lots of time to get involved in direct sourcing and to really add value and to place these great candidates at uh, direct sourcing jobs. So it's really something that um, if you want to do it and you have the right people to do it, it can be incredibly beneficial for you and the client. Um, and I'm going to pass it back again to Susan. Thanks, Mackenzie. Uh, this next session that I attended was called Digital Transformation and the Future of Staffing um, with Art Habits, the founder and CEO of Bullhorn. The summary of the discussion is that the new technologies won't completely replace the human element of staffing. I think we can all be thankful for that. Art pointed out that people aren't going to install all the apps and answer endless anonymous text messages. Um, when Barry asked his opinion on direct sourcing, he said that he doesn't feel like direct sourcing will be the next industry industry disruptor. As he put it, someone still needs to sift through the 100 unwashed resumes. Um, and who solves the problem? And for direct sourcing to be successful, you generally need a huge brand name. Um, obscure companies are definitely at a disadvantage when it comes to direct sourcing. The next point that um, I took away was staffing execs can't avoid technology anymore. AI and blockchain are emerging trends, and someday employees might be asking to be paid in Bitcoin. He did make the comment that he believes we are still a ways away from that. Pre-COVID, for systems like Workin, Sense, and Shift Gig, 
he said it was a missionary educational sales situation. I love that, that phrase. And that has now changed. And when asked about his prediction for the next 10 years, he joked that Dr. Fauci will still be telling us to wear our masks, that the staffing industry will be a trillion dollar industry. And then like every great conference speaker, he slid a nice shameless plug in for Bullhorn and predicted that Bullhorn will be toiling away, spending tens of millions on R&D to drive increased digital transformation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mandy. Thanks, Susan. The next session that I attended was called The Evolution of Pay, and it was presented by ADP. And in this session, they presented findings from a new survey they conducted, and it was focused on employee and employer perceptions about traditional and emerging pay methods. The biggest takeaway for me was that adopting more advanced and flexible pay models can be a competitive advantage for a staffing firm, both in recruiting talent and retaining temporary associates. And according to George and Lisa, there are three main components that are driving change in pay models. The first is a shift in workforce composition. Right now we have a more diverse workforce, which is comprised of five generations, that's never happened before, and it includes both the gig economy and the remote workforce. This is all driving the need for more diverse pay priorities. The second is consumerization of payments. Right now, individuals' ex expectations and demand for convenience are rising. You know, think about how paying tolls has changed just over the last several years. Instead of dropping our money into a bucket or handing it to a toll taker, we now want to pay a toll without even stopping our car. So that de demand for convenience and speed is there. And then the third is the rise of non-traditional financial products. For example, contactless payment like Apple Pay, Venmo, and Google Pay, they've all exploded and they are accelerating the shift to a cashless economy. So the question is, how can staffing firms use these trends to their advantage? And ADP's survey results suggest that both employees and employers agree that offering alternative payment methods would provide a competitive edge in recruiting. They shared data to back that up, and here are three stats that stood out to me. The first is that over 60% of employees indicated that off-cycle pay options, same-day pay, early access to pay for a fee, and pay cards would make a difference when considering a job offer. And likewise, 71% of employers surveyed indicated that they would need to customize pay options to compete in the war for talent. So employers are realizing this. And then finally, 74%, so nearly three in four of employees indicated that they want to work for a company that cares about their financial wellness. So if you're looking for a recruiting advantage, adopting a more flexible pay model could help you attract more candidates, particularly millennials and Generation Z, and even retain temporary associates. And now I'm going to turn it over to David, who's going to tell us about recruitment marketing mastery. Thanks, Manny. And actually, before I jump in, I want to a quick shout out and thank you to Beth Lane from Staffing Industry Analyst, who chimed in on the questions. Um, we, everyone listening today, you sort of have a, I think it's a kind of a once and forever opportunity because the conference was done virtually this year. Every session was recorded and the recordings are available for on-demand replay. You can contact uh, SIA, I need to be an email address. It's member services at staffingindustry.com. Again, it's member services at staffingindustry.com. If you're currently a corporate member of SIA, the cost to get all the recordings, remember everything we're doing in three minutes a slide here is a full hour of content. It's uh, $579. And if you're not a member, you can get it for $679. And that's through May the 11th. So thank you, Beth. Appreciate your sharing that. Um, I think that's a great opportunity. Uh, having been able to listen in this year, it's fantastic. Being there in years past, this is just content you can't get anywhere else. So that's a tremendous investment to make for your business. All right, so earlier, Keith uh, Summers had put a question and asking about, was there anything covered about the challenge with recruiting? And I sent him back a message saying, no, there wasn't anything covered. Keith, I completely forgot the fact that I did a presentation on recruiting. Um, but, but this conference was actually held about a week, almost, almost exactly a week before the wheels fell off the cart in recruiting. And it was pretty much the day the stimulus package was announced. And this is not a political statement, but there's now 
a tremendous disincentive to work. If you combine the enhanced and extended unemployment benefits with the stimulus payments and somebody who's in a family of four just got what $5,600 plus the equivalent pay rate of about 12 to 12.50 to as much as $13 an hour, depending on where they're located in hourly wages to stay home. So every staffing company has seen a huge hit on recruiting in the last few weeks, um, particularly those of you who recruit any jobs with pay rates less than about 17 bucks an hour. So during my presentation at, at the exec forum, did a talk on the four pillars of recruitment marketing. And next Tuesday, we're actually going to be doing a special edition of Lunch with Haley, where we're going to focus on specific strategies you can look at right now to try to fill more job openings. But this, the four pillars that you can look at today are, number one, thinking about your employment brand. As a staffing company, how are you known? If you think about the industry as a whole, or if someone says, hey, I'm a temp, you know, what's the connotation? When you're recruiting, you're dealing with the good, the bad, the ugly of being branded with being part of the staffing industry. So how do you elevate your brand above the competition? How do you make yourself an employer of choice in your community or for the industry for which you recruit? So you want to define your value proposition and figure out why your value is greater and then how to communicate that value through every touch point a, a candidate might see. Uh, from your website to your social media to your email marketing to any recruiting events that you're now doing. A big thing that matters that's related to your brand strategy is social proof. And if you do not have a proactive game plan to deal with your online reputation, you absolutely need to put one into place. So the proactive strategy means doing things like getting immediate feedback from candidates after every service experience to see if they're happy. And for those who are happy, we're asking them to leave a testimony or leave an online re review. Those who are unhappy, we're getting their feedback in a private way so we can react to it, address it, uh, but make sure that we're in charge as best we can of what's being said about us online. And because we're in staffing and the majority of people we interview, we don't place, there's gonna be negative comments. So to deal with the negative comments, you wanna also have a game plan for how do we address them? If someone leaves you that bad review on Google, on Indeed, how do you respond? And you want to make sure you, you're having an intelligent response mechanism so that you're addressing valid complaints. You're not hiding from them. You're not just deleting them. And at the same time, if you get trolls who are just terrible to deal with and aren't going to engage in intelligent conversation, you get the conversations off of social media and uh, into a private channel. Then your website itself, for most of you, you're getting hundreds, if not thousands of times more visitors, more candidates visiting your website each and every week than people actually applying to your jobs. So you have to look for ways to optimize the site, starting with the job application itself, then the overall career portal, then the website to get people to the career portal, and then also after people leave the website to do things to engage them either just before they leave, they have the ability to do exit pop-ups, or to use paid advertising to re-engage people after they've left or email to re-engage people after they've left to bring them back because a candidate who returns to your website is actually twice as likely to apply to a job. When it comes to where you're spending your money on advertising, we don't wanna just go on gut feel. We wanna be making data-driven job spend decisions. And what that means is really looking at which jobs you're getting applications for, what your costs are per apply, what your fill rates are for different jobs, what job titles are getting different levels of response, which geographies are getting different kinds of responses and doing lots and lots of testing. And then using the analytics to then figure out where to spend money. Now this can seem impossible to do on your own and you'd be right if you thought that. You need software. The whole field of programmatic job advertising has come about to help provide systems, automation, to help you make these decisions in real time based on what's happening. Without automation, without programmatic, the data shows that about 6% of any company's jobs will eat up 48%, just about half of their total advertising budget. So the, the other half is left for 94% of the jobs. When you've got dozens or hundreds of jobs to fill, you need the dollars going to the jobs that need the most. And lastly, 
uh, to look at social recruiting. And we've seen a lot of staffing companies where social recruiting is not much more than posting jobs. In other cases, it's just posting random content. Well, you need to have a strategy, one for active job seekers, a different one for passive job seekers. And you need to have strategies that match where your candidates use social media. If you're mostly in professional staffing, you're probably mostly gonna be on LinkedIn. If you're in industrial, clerical, uh, healthcare, you're probably gonna need a big Facebook strategy. If you've got a younger workforce, you're gonna need an Instagram strategy. You might need to be looking at TikTok as part of the strategy. You may need to be on Clubhouse. And I know it can be overwhelming, but the idea is to understand where your candidates go online, where they spend their time, and then how to engage with them based on their attitude towards their careers and where they are in the job hunting process. All right, and now that's it for my presentation. I think we're going back to Susan for our next talk on a follow-up with Greg McCown. Thanks, David. Okay, this session, I really enjoyed Greg's session. Greg is the author of the book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. And the concept of essentialism and the examples he gave made the theory he was presenting very compelling to listen to, which considering his was the last session of a long day of sessions is saying a lot. He had one of my favorite quotes of the conference when he said, the word priority originated as singular, not plural. And when you think about this, it makes total sense. How can you have more than one priority? Basically, his message regarding essentialism is similar to the concept of that book that was popular a few years ago about Swedish death cleaning, only instead of material possessions you're getting rid of, it's the decisions you make and what you can do and what you can't do. If you say yes to something, it's saying no to something else. He also talks about the success paradox, how in the early days of any venture, you have focus then phase two is that clarity leads to success. Phase three is the success breeds options and opportunities. And phase four is the undisciplined pursuit of more. His point was success can be a catalyst for failure. He quoted Bill Hewlett, um, founder of Hewlett Packard, that more companies die of indigestion than starvation. And I love that quote. A few other takeaways were that essentialism isn't something you do, it's actually a mindset, less but better, and that you can define strategy by what you say no to, which I thought was a very interesting way of thinking about strategy. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Mackenzie. Thanks, Susan. Um, so this uh, presentation was about the new era of staffing and the rise of sign-up culture. So one thing that they talked about was how Uber uh, and similar companies were niche use case, right? But now they're the norm. Um, getting hired and paid weekly is now an expectation wherever you work. Um, you know, people want to get hired fast, they want to get paid fast, um, and if your company is not going to do it, they can find another job that will. So, something to keep in mind. Um, another point that they made was uh, it's important to start building a bridge between what's possible and what's compliant. Um, take away that excuse from yourself of why it's not possible to do something just because it's complex, um, which really leads into the third point of everything in your life right now is part of sign up culture um, that really came into play in 2020 when we were all stuck at home and watching netflix and ordering food on our phones but everything in your life is a sign of experience within a mobile app for the most part so healthcare, food entertainment even your gym um, it's all done through an app or through your phone um, and work and getting a job are also one of those things that as a consumer um, they're looking to do online so if you don't have a current mobile app for your staffing company, if you don't have a really good mobile experience for your website, um, those are going to make it harder for people to find jobs and they're going to go somewhere else where it's easier to do online and through um, their phone. So all good things to keep in mind and really uh, interesting points I thought they made. So I'm actually going to pass it backwards over to Susan. Thanks, Mackenzie. 
This next session that I attended was Harnessing AI and Automation to Build a Powerful Recruiting Machine um, with Pankaj and Jason from Sense. One of the points made was recruiters are buried in technologies that don't talk to each other and that an AI and automation tool should become your hub to recruit, retain, and redeploy talent on a large scale. For recruiting, staffing companies need to think beyond candidates. Clients, ex-employees, and internal staff are all sources. I think it's easy to forget that. Um, in my early days of staffing, it was drilled into our heads that in every conversation with a candidate or client or the happy hour bartender, for that matter, you would ask if they knew of someone looking for work. AI and automation can make reaching out to other sources for recruiting quicker and easier. Uh, another point was 75% of recruiters' time is spent on manual tasks versus closing candidates. Um, I, that, that percentage shocked me. AI and automation frees up the recruiter's time to focus on stages of placement where the personal relationship is important. And this was kind of a theme that I heard in, in multiple sessions. Some of the session was a demo of sense and it capabilities, which I really enjoyed, but something I kept thinking while I was watching the demo was the automation is the tool, but you still need to create engaging content or the end user is going to either ignore it or bail out mid-process. So I'm going to pass it to myself here. The next session I attended was navigating the bleeding edge, creating a successful technology strategy to automate your staffing company. Um, and this um, session was with um, Rishab, the CEO of Aviante. So he feels that one of the most common errors that happen in staffing technology decisions is that companies don't think about the fact that they are building the backbone of their business. His advice was to take a holistic approach and don't focus too much on the bells and whistles. Another point that he made was to fix your processes first. If you don't, you'll just be automating a bad process. He also echoed um, what Pankaj from Sense said that AI is going to play a much bigger role in staffing with a huge benefit being the recruiter will be freed up from many of the routine tasks that they're burdened with today to spend more time engaged with the talent. And his final observation was really interesting. He said that Talent is realizing the automations available to them are now allowing them to control their job search. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Mackenzie. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, this presentation was called Experience Sharing, the ways staffing companies can succeed in the current environment. And their first point that they made was to really embrace a work from anywhere culture. Um, you can use technology to streamline that work and also help your team collaborate, which is something you should really be trying to do, empowering your team to collaborate and work from anywhere. Um, it also gives your team an opportunity to engage in a competitive global workforce that's not bound by geography. So if you work in a specific niche and the best person uh, for that open job is four states away, if you have the right technology in place, that's not a problem. The second point was investing in sales rather than cost reduction. So pivoting to thriving business segments. If you are light industrial and you notice that there's a different segment somewhere that's getting a lot more people like healthcare, maybe it's time to pivot into healthcare. Maybe it's time to really focus on the people and processes that are driving the most uh, sales and are boosting your ROI within your company. Um, it's also an opportunity for training and leveraging the untapped knowledge of your team. So not just focusing on what isn't losing money, um, but really spending money on the right things. And then their last point, which I thought was really important, is to humanize all that you do. Um, the companies that are succeeding, uh, that succeeded in 2020 and made it into this year, are the ones that treat people as humans, albeit imperfect humans. Um, they really demystify the concerns or challenges of staffing uh, by humanizing yourself and the company you work for. So take the scary part away out of applying, out of job seeking, out of working with a staffing agency, and you'll get a much better return. Um, and I believe I am handing it back again to Susan. 
continuing our ping pong, Mackenzie. So my next session was from staffing to solutions, lessons from the frontier. This session was discussing the increasing need for staffing firms to not just provide people, but to provide complete solutions. One of the takeaways was that moving to manage services, you can form a deeper partnership to solve more problems. You get a lot stickier with your clients. And all the panelists agreed that you don't need to pivot your entire staffing business. Staffing is still core to what you do, and but there's a culture benefit as well, especially for the salespeople who can now offer a lot more to the client. And staffing companies have an advantage here because they can leverage their existing processes to ramp up quickly. One driver of this blended model is profitability. EBITDA can be 18 to 20% compared to eight to 9% for staffing only. And then finally, the shift in mindset is you are selling teams who are pri providing solutions versus selling people, or rather headcount versus outcome-based. Um, outcome and now I am, I believe, handing off to Mandy. Yeah, the ping pong game is over. Thanks, Susan. This session was called The Role of the Recruiter in a Tech First World, and it was another panel discussion. I really like this one because there were a lot of practical takeaways that made me think. Um, human interaction is critical in the staffing industry, but as we all know, technology can make recruiters more efficient. The panel's conversation was about how to strike the right balance and integrate new tech successfully. First, it's important to realize that as social distancing requirements begin relaxing, people are going to crave human connection more than ever. So it's important to strike the right balance by automating processes that are repetitive, time consuming, or that create friction in the recruiting process, and by using technology to give recruiters more time for their highest value, high touch activities. So uh, then they moved on to what can or should be automated. And here are a few candidate processes that are right for automation. Candidate intake, job posting and distribution, job recommendations for candidates, redeployment before assignments end to keep associates working for you, candidate engagement, this is checking in with associates throughout their assignment to gauge their satisfaction and address small issues before they escalate, and then re-engagement, and that involves reactivating former associates or candidates. And then finally, the panel shared tips to increase successful adoption of new technology by your staffing firm by being intentional, and following a consistent process. Uh, for example, they recommended involving internal stakeholders early in the decision-making process when you're first evaluating your options. They advise demoing multiple products and then bringing in end users to get their input so they can see what the technology is like, what it's like to use, how it might work or not work in your business. And you should also consider testing multiple products at once if you can do this on a trial basis. It's not always possible. And you should also, when you're in the evaluation phase, determine how you're going to measure ROI for this technology. You need to be able to gauge the success and effectiveness of your technology. And then to plan for a successful rollout with new technology, you should explain the big picture. Ask, you know, or consider why are you making this change? What are the benefits? And what will the implementation really look like? Think all of that through and explain it to everyone. And be honest about the positives and the negatives. For example, if it's going to have a big impact on your employee's daily workflow, or if users should expect a steep learning curve, be honest about that and it's going to help increase the adoption and decrease resistance. You should also plan on formal training in a variety of formats, considering the different learning styles and generational differences among your learners. You should also leverage early adopters in your company as champions. If you have people who just love learning new technology, use that to your advantage. You should also plan peer-to-peer -peer learning to increase adoption and shorten learning curves. And then finally, you should plan follow-up. You don't just drop a new technology, provide initial training, and consider the job done. You need to think through what's working, what's not working, and then what are the best practices for using and implementing this technology moving forward. And uh, surprise, surprise, I'm going to kick it back to Susan again for technology strategies for a disrupted world. Thanks, Mandy. 
I loved the dynamic of this panel. There were two executives from very large companies, and then Lauren Jones, who has worked for both small and large staffing companies, helping them implement technology. And she now does industry technology consulting. So she works with a wide range of staffing companies. The first part of the discussion was around what is the focus as we emerged out of 2020. Uh, recent technology efforts have been around building more advanced integrations and focusing on anything candidate facing. Also, because 2020 was fast and loose, there um, should be an effort toward proper implementation and cleanup of data and processes. The next takeaway I had was now that we've proven we can move at a faster pace, there is more willingness um, and change in attitude about technology. Lauren mentioned that she's noticed that the conversations she's having has changed from I need a good product to I need a good platform. So I think 2020 has made everyone realize how important their tech stack is to the survival and growth of their business. When it comes to platforms, it is about the data and the user experience. There is a balance that needs to be created and a theme in a lot of the sessions, as I have already stated, was that the staffing industry is still figuring that out. With everyone white labeling their own apps, candidates don't want to download four to six or 10 apps. And we need to keep that in mind while we're all figuring it out. We need to keep the candidate experience in mind. And now we are going to move on to our lessons learned. So I'm going to turn it over to David. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great uh, information. Great recaps of the sessions that you were able to get to. So how about some take home from each of us? I'll, I'll kick things off. So what did I get out of this year's executive forum? Well, first off is this should be an incredibly good year for the staffing industry. Um, save for the current recruiting challenges that are leading to too many unfilled job openings, we're forecast to have an exceptionally high level of GDP growth of 6.2%. So what's that going to mean? You're going to have a lot of competition, both to win clients and to win talent, and to win talent not just with other staffing companies, but you're going to be competing with your clients. So how, what is your strategy for competition? If you don't have a really solid strategy for a high-growth marketplace, you need to go back and take a look at your sales strategies, your marketing strategies, your recruiting, your recruitment marketing strategies, and think about it in an environment of incredibly strong demand for talent, which is what 6.2% GDP will mean, how will we compete? Um, as you're probably feeling right now, there's nothing worse than having job orders that go unfilled. And as I think you heard from the majority of the talks, if you don't have a digital transformation strategy, you need to really think about what your strategy is going to look like. On one hand, you may be looking at becoming more digital, apps, automation. Um, but you also have to think about where are you going to compete? You know, can you outspend a global staffing company and what they're putting into technology? Can you buy a platform that will allow you to do more with less? So you want to think about your service process. I think Ryan may have mentioned the candidate experience and also the client experience and how you will digitize it to improve efficiency and improve that experience for your clients and candidates. But at the same time, your digital transformation isn't just about technology. Um, as at least one of the presenters mentioned, it's also about being more human. Some companies are gonna succeed by being an anti-automation company. They're gonna get closer to their clients and candidates. They're gonna provide a higher level of personal service. Um, Going on this week is a global conference for members of an organization called EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. There's a global learning event. And all the speakers I've watched this week have talked about the need to create more human bonds, especially what the pandemic has done to us is it's broken a lot of our touch points with our employees, with our clients, with our vendors. So there is an opportunity to grow, not just through digital transformation, but human transformation and using technology to better enable human transformation. This is another one that probably leads more back to the digital than the human, but as we get younger in the workforce, um, I'm the, I guess probably, I, I'm this undefined year between baby boomer and Gen X. It's my birthday, they were, were actually a year that had nothing. Uh, but what's happening with the generations coming up is they prefer to talk to devices rather than people. I heard a speaker this morning, it was Seth Godin talking about, not marketing, but he was talking about 
what uh, kids today want, and more kids would rather get a new cell phone than a new car. People want to talk to their devices. So what does that mean? So great service in your business is about providing an experience in the way people want it. So how do you provide a great experience, a human experience, to people who want to make their phone the primary mechanism for interacting with your organization? All right, Ryan, those are my thoughts. How about you? Thanks, David. Yeah, really great stuff. Um, so uh, three takeaways. One, prioritizing the candidate experience. You hit on this a bit, and several of us have, but you know, in this hyper-competitive market for talent, everything should be done to give the candidate a great experience from the moment they first find you all the way through onboarding and placement. Um, you know, chatbots to serve uh, after hours we talked about, a wonderful search and apply experience on mobile that you hit on, and uh, not having to enter their data more than once. So frustrating. Those are all critical things to successfully win the war on talent, uh, war for talent. Uh, second one is, is leveraging your existing database. So especially with most temp staffing, we've seen a crushing drought in active job seekers. And while these extremes, you know, hopefully they're very temporary, it makes the importance of maximizing the value of the recruiting work you've already done as important as ever. If the cost per apply on Indeed is up a whopping 40%, or it might even be more by today, but you've got a database of emails and phone numbers from candidates that already know you and your brand, and you've already done the work to recruit, where should you focus your ROI? Uh, too often in both sales and marketing, psychology drives us to always seek out the new and shiny, and we totally miss the opportunity right in front of our face to re-engage. So there's a lot of great ways you can do that. And then uh, lastly, training your sales team for success. You know, if sales keeps bringing in job orders below what the market supports, they drive zero revenue and everyone fails. Uh, so with the influx of investment and pent up demand that's uh, about to be unleashed with the record GDP growth that you just touched on, it's a great time to be picky about who you partner with and to educate your clients on exactly what's required to make successful placements. And uh, uh, passing on to you, Mackenzie. Thanks, Ryan. Um, my first point that I really took away from this is that the only way to become one of the 53 or not become one of the 53% of small businesses that doesn't reopen is to adapt. So uh, David uses a great analogy from this book, Who Moved My Cheese? Um, you know, there's two rats in a maze. They move the cheese one day and the one rat keeps going back to where the cheese used to be and the other rat goes looking for the new cheese. You want to be looking for that new cheese. If candidates aren't where they used to be, don't just sit around and wait for them to come back. You need to adapt. You need to change your strategies. Find a new way to get those candidates back. Um, the second point is to really invest in technology. Um, you can't afford to get left behind. If you're not using technology, if you're not using new, modern, current, mobile-first technology, um, you're going to be left behind. You're going to miss out on the best candidates in the field right now. And then the last big point was something that I took away from one of the keynotes um, about essentialism. Um, and it, it applies to business, but it can really also apply to your personal life. And it's really just determine what your es essential intent is for the next three months, um, what it is by day, by weeks, um, and really find what your number one priority is and work towards that. So now I'm gonna do my favorite thing and pass it back to Susan. Thanks, Mackenzie. So one of my lessons um, from the conference was staffing companies need to start thinking of themselves as providing solutions, not just providing people. We need to make ourselves even more relevant. The next one is the industry is on the cusp of another big shift, similar to when BMS came on the scene, and we need to embrace the disruption this time. And on the other side of all this, we will have found a balance of technology and service, and that technology will never be able to give white glove service. So we had Brad Biley on our team who had attended the conference, and he unfortunately wasn't able to join us today, but he had some lessons learned that he wanted us to share. His first one is networking is still critical and possible, even in a virtual conference setting. Data shows remote work has been successful, but work to keep your meetings short to maximize productivity and over communicate when not meeting. And how will you continue to adapt if 20% of tent jobs stay remote after the pandemic? 
Hey, and Susan, now I'm going to turn Susan, it over before, to Mandy. Before you, oh. uh, before you turn it over to Mandy, I wanted to just throw something in there. I actually heard Gary Vaynerchuk talking last night in that EO conference about meetings. And he said the, the average 60 minute meeting is really a 36 minute meeting it's with 24 minutes of wasted time. So he only schedules his hour long meetings for 36 meetings minutes. And his 15 minute meetings, he said he scheduled those for seven minutes. That was just a great idea is just taking weird amounts of time, scheduling for less, it forces you to be more productive. And so sorry for interrupting, back to you, Mandy. Thanks, David. I had three takeaways. The first one is to prepare for that V-shaped recovery because the indicators are showing that there's going to be a rapid ramp up in both temp and direct as the vaccine rollout continues. Um, the second one is to develop your account manager's expertise in selling remote temp and contract where you can because the research is showing us that employers are open to the idea even after we are uh, we have reached herd immunity. And then the third takeaway for me was to prepare teams and a strategic business plan to be the windshield and not the bog, just going back to that disruption uh, keynote presentation, because this disruption and change is here to stay. Back over to you, David. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate um, all of your time to attend the sessions, put together the summary. Great stuff um, for everybody who's joined us today. Thank you so much for being part of today's Lunch with Haley event. If you're looking at recruiting challenges, you're looking at marketing challenges, and you just need some advice, please feel free to give us a ring, 888-696-2900, or shoot us an email. We're happy to put together what we call a recruitment marketing or a marketing roadmap for your business. It's a no-cost service to help you figure out what are the right strategies and tactics to address the challenges you're facing right now. Um, there's one other slide in here. If you also have not seen our net social product and you're looking to get it, do a better job of getting your team involved in social sharing, probably for recruiting right now, we now have a new way to help with the automation of your team-wide content sharing. And coming up, you're going to see from Haley Marketing in the next few days, a special offer to get six months of net social free with any of our branded content solutions. So watch your inbox. If there are questions, please, again, reach out to us, phone, email, on the socials. We are more than happy to answer questions. And if you can, please join us next week on Tuesday for our special edition of Lunch with Haley. We're going to talk about recruiting strategies for 2021, how to get through what's going on right now as best you can. And then later on in the week, we're going to be doing our monthly product demo. And this month, we'll be giving you an update on our managed social marketing service, Social Pro. Again, from all of us at Haley Marketing, thank you so much for being part of today's Lunch with Haley event.